Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us for the fourth week of CRISPR-Con 2020. I'm Julie Shapiro with Keystone Policy Center. Keystone is a third-party, nonprofit, non-advocacy organization bringing together diverse perspectives on societal challenges. Keystone Policy Center is based in Keystone, Colorado, on the lands of the Ute people. We're proud to facilitate CRISPR-Con's conversations on science, society, and the future of gene editing. CRISPR-Con aims to highlight many perspectives and experiences, spark curiosity, build understanding, and share societal histories and contexts relevant to decisions on gene editing technologies in applications of agriculture and food, conservation, health, and more. 2020 is CRISPR-Con's fourth year, and in the virtual format, we have 10 webinars and five themes over two months. Throughout the entire series, we have a broad ranging lineup of speakers, including life scientists and social scientists, journalists, business leaders, farmers, conservationists, consumer advocates and social justice advocates, global economic development leaders, religious leaders, funders and philanthropists, and more. If you missed any of our earlier virtual sessions, we encourage you to check them out along with prior year's programming on our CRISPR-Con YouTube channel. So far this year, we've discussed gene editing in the context of race and health disparities, indigenous perspectives, storytelling and journalism, gene editing research and governance in China, and the potential for societal benefits in agriculture. Planning for this week's session was conducted in partnership with the Genetic Engineering and Society Center at North Carolina State University. Thanks to the whole GES team and special thanks to Katie Barnhill Dilling, Jennifer Kuzma, and Patty Mulligan. The GES team's partnership on this effort was entirely in kind. They did not receive funding from CRISPR-Con or its sponsors for this event. We also want to thank our sponsors for supporting the mission of CRISPR-Con and our ability to create these important conversations. Our programmatic sponsors are Corteva and United Soybean Board, and additional sponsorship for this session comes from Genus and Bayer. You can visit the virtual expo in Hopin to link to relevant past CRISPR-Con content and also to learn more about this week's partners and sponsors. Let me now introduce our session theme for today. This week, CRISPR-Con will explore themes of equity, environment, and agriculture. Today, we will explore how risks are defined and governed in food and agricultural systems. And on Thursday, we will explore potential intersections of equity, climate, and conservation. As we'll hear today, societal concerns regarding gene-edited food and agriculture products are wide-ranging. The assessment and management of various potential risks is distributed among regulators, researchers, and developers, and other societal actors. Questions of who defines what risks and concerns are managed, who manages them, and to what standard represent equity and political concerns in the risk governance process. This panel today will consider the scope and governance of different categories of risks and concerns, including how they are currently addressed and how they might alternatively be addressed through regulatory and other processes. We hope that the dialogue will bring out lots of lively discussion and debate among panelists and participants. If you're joining us via Hopin, please use the stage chat on the right-hand side of your screen to submit questions for the panelists at any time. Divergence and disagreement are welcome. Please be empathetic, curious, engaged, and respectful as you listen and share across various perspectives. At noon Eastern, after our panel session, we will transition into Ideas Marketplace sessions for small group discussions, and we hope you'll stick around and participate in those as well. So at this time, I'd like to invite our moderator and the panelists to join me on stage. I'll ask each of them to share their audio and video as I begin to introduce them briefly. And we'll hear more from each of our panelists on their background throughout the conversation. Detailed biographies of each of our panelists and our moderator are available at our CRISPR-Con website. So our moderator is Jennifer Kuzma, the Goodnight NCGSK Foundation Distinguished Professor in the School of Public and International Affairs and co-director of the Genetic Engineering and Society Center at North Carolina State University. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you. Sarah Gallo is director of market access for food and farm innovation at the Biotechnology Innovation Organization. Welcome, Sarah. Greg Jaffe is director of the Project on Biotechnology for the Center for Science in the Public Interest. Welcome, Greg. 
Salim Lawafi is a social scientist and assistant de deputy director of genetic improvement and plant adaptation research at CRAD, the French Center for Agricultural Research for Development. Hello, Salim. And finally, welcome to Elian Ubalijaro, um, who is a deputy, executor, a deputy executive, executive director for programs at Global Open Data in Agriculture and Nutrition. And I'll now be removing myself from the screen so that Elian can come on. And I'll be turning things over to Jennifer to walk us through a panel on gene editing governance in food and agriculture. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Julie. First, I want to thank Keystone, Julie, and all the staff for putting CRISPR-Con on under extremely challenging and difficult circumstances. Uh, they've really done a fabulous job, and the conversations over the last several weeks have been stellar. So I attended the first CRISPR-Con and moderated a panel there, and so it's, a really, it's an honor and privilege to be back to do so again. I also want to thank all of you for attending this important event. Uh, this topic for today, as you heard from Julie, is risk governance of gene-edited food, and in particular, the intersections of safety and equity. The panelists and I thought it would be important to first define a couple of terms for our panel today, and the first being governance. So I'd like you to consider a definition of governance that includes all types of watchful and responsible care throughout the life cycle of a, a gene-edited product. For example, all the way from conception and the anticipation of risks or or benefits or other societal impacts to the downstream stages of consumer decision-making, monitoring, and it includes regulation, but it's not limited to that in that these processes can be uh, voluntary ones, data sharing, corporate social responsibility, and all other types of ways that we watchfully and responsibly care for emerging technologies. Whereas governance may be more narrow in the fact that it is usually based on legal formal mechanisms that are administered by government agencies. And those might consider particular risks or harms under various statutes. So we just thought we would define those two terms so then we've switched back and forth from them, the audience may at least know what our, our definition um, entails. So with hundreds of gene edited plants in development and gene edited foods and several that have cleared regulatory agencies, it's a particularly important time to consider risk governance and how well we're poised to watchfully and responsibly care for these products as they move through and enter society. So let's start with the panel discussion. Uh, first, before we get into the questions that we've prepared, I'd like to let you know that we are taking audience questions in the chat, and we will begin to select from those questions as the panel progresses. But first, to open, I'd like each of you to tell us a little bit about yourselves and your work on issues of gene editing and governance. So let's start with Eliane. Okay. So um, I'm Eliani Belladro. I'm based in Canada and Montreal, where I work for Global Open Data and Agriculture Nutrition. And so my interest is in the work I do, we are looking at how data can help empower the 820 million people who go hungry every day and the 2.7 billion who live in food insecurity. And so how does data and influence their capacity to be empowered in terms of what they do. And so I'm currently, uh, I'm a molecular geneticist by training and, and I've, I've worked uh, in the biotechnology industry. I've, I've advised governments, I've worked in the sustainability field. And I'm currently um, preparing a report for FEO on legal and policy analysis of ownership and control of agricultural data. So this is, and, and so within my work, I see uh, what's happening in terms of uh, CRISPR and, and gene editing as important part of the knowledge base that is being uh, accessible and usable in agriculture that affects the livelihoods of smallholder farmers. Wonderful, thank you. Salim? Hi, thank you, Jennifer. My name is uh, Salim Louafi. I'm based in Syrah in Montpellier, south of uh, France. And I'm uh, the assistant deputy director of uh, the uh, research unit that is mainly composed of biologists and geneticists, and that deals with uh, genetic improvement and adaptation of tropical plant and, and Mediterranean plant. And we work a lot in collaboration with uh, developing countries. 
And I'm a social scientist uh, there, and my main interest is on global governance of agrobiodiversity, and more specifically on science policy interface. How policy impacts science and the conduct of science, collaboration and production of science, but also how science has an impact on the dynamic of uh, global policy discussion on agrobiodiversity and biotechnology. And uh, before uh, joining CIRAD, um, uh, I used to work uh, as a, a senior officer at the Secretariat of the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture in Rome, in, in FAO, the UN Organization um, for Food and Agriculture. And, uh, um, and I'm also a member of um, uh, the Economic, Ethical and Social Committee of the French High Council on Biotechnology, which is an independent body in charge of advising the French government on, on biotechnology issues. Uh, so I took part to, um, to some uh, discussion there um, with different stakeholders on, on, on issue of uh, genome editing. And I've also be, I, I was also part of the, 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 the first ex, uh, of the team of the first uh, external evaluation of the International Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, IPBES. Thank yeah, you. Wonderful, thank you. Greg. Hi, I'm Greg Jaffe. I'm the director of the Biotechnology Project at the Center for Science and Public Interest. Uh, my background is an undergraduate degree in biology, and I'm also a lawyer. I've been an environmental lawyer my whole life. I've worked inside the government and also at CSPI. Um, CSPI is a nonprofit consumer group located in Washington, D.C. We work on food and nutrition issues. Um, we try to advocate and educate based on the best available science out there. Um, we take no funds from corporations um, and never have in our 50 year plus of existence, nor any grants from the federal government. And we do that to sort of keep our independence and to prevent any conflicts of interest. As I said, I run the biotechnology project, which works on issues around genetic engineering, gene editing, clothed animals, cell cultured meat, and other new and emerging food and agricultural technologies. And, and uh, you know, what we work on is trying to figure out how are we going to ensure the safety of these products, but also um, get, provide information uh, to consumers so that society can get the benefits from these products while minimizing the risks of these products. So, so when you mentioned uh, the definition of governance and thought of think of it as regulation plus. And so I, I, I come to this issue working a lot on the regulation, on the laws and regulations that are done to ensure safety of products. Uh, that's a minimum for con commercial entry. But we also work at issues around the broader governance, around engagement, around transparency, around stewardship, because it's not just uh, about safety, but also um, have building trust and having information so that people want to purchase these products and we can get those benefits. Wonderful. Thank you, Greg. Sarah. Hi, good morning. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sarah Gallo. I'm the Director of Market Access for Food and Farm Innovation at the Biotechnology Innovation Organization. At BIO, our members are working at the intersection of biology and technology across organisms, plants, animals, and microbial applications, and a variety of technology platforms, all focused on bringing beneficial products to the marketplace, similar to what Greg just said. Um, my work as the Director of Market Access is really uh, founded on, on the principle that innovation flourishes when science and consumer values are aligned and they complement one another. We know at BIO that the regula U.S. regulatory approach can't exist in isolation. So what my work at BIO is focused on is really developing a proactive approach to transparency in order to build trust and foster an inclusive environment where we can work together to solve some of society's most pressing challenges, whether that is on the nutritional side or the environmental side or on the climate. Our members understand that consumers want to know more information about innovative biotechnologies like gene editing. They wanna know what's in their food and they wanna know whether their food is safe. Our members and our work is really committed to be a driver of that endeavor. And I look forward to talking about a number of those issues today. So thank you for the invitation to be here. Great. Well, as you all can tell, we have a, a stellar panel representing, representing different countries and different areas of, of expertise and perspectives on governance. So 
the first question will we'll hit you with an easy one, which is a joke. Um, in understanding the landscape of risk governance, what do you consider to be the biggest risks or societal impacts that we should worry about with gene edited foods or other gene edited agricultural products? And I'll leave it open to whoever wants to go first this time. I was just talking, so I'm happy to talk. <laughs> okay, Sarah, go ahead. <laughs> so I can, I can kick it off. Sure. I think, um, you know, fundamentally we know that no single company or association is going to accomplish the goal of building trust that enables the innovation to be accepted into the marketplace. So my biggest, uh, as I think about the biggest risks um, that exist, uh, my biggest concern is that we're not going to achieve the level of trust that's needed to build a successful and beneficial innovation ecosystem. I think there are a few important factors that go into that. And I know, Jennifer, you're prepared to guide us through a conversation about those today. You know, we're, we're here today talking about gene editing, but I think when we're talking about trust and, and risk of trust, it really goes beyond that and how we need to build trust for the future, thinking about those technology platforms that are yet to come. Um, you know, Bio has been fortunate to hold a, a series of convening events that um, happened in person last year, of course, and virtually this year. And, I, and one of the big issues that comes forward, and I think it's directly related to that trust ecosystem, is that it's not acceptable to hide information or, or have the perception of hiding information from consumers. That's something that we really need to focus on, and, and that's going to be critical to having that trust-based ecosystem. Um, we're also going to need to think about how we look at participation from a variety of companies working on a variety of plants, animals, and microbial products across a variety of geographies, which I know my colleagues on the panel today are, are better equipped to talk about than I am. Um, and, and lastly, I just wanted to touch on the fact that we really should be thinking about trust and transparency as a whole value chain activity. So certainly as the representative of the technology developers here today, um, we have a big part to play in that. But if we're really going to foster trust and, and, um, and tackle that risk, then we, we should be thinking collectively about how we all play a part in that conversation. So, um, so I'll jump in there here, Jennifer. Um, although I am gonna push back on you on your question in two ways. First, uh, um, I don't wanna clarify things as the biggest risk. I think there are lots of ones out there. And so I'm gonna talk about three of them, but I'm not gonna say that these are the biggest or the most important. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think we have enough evidence or data to suggest any of those yet. And the second one is I'm gonna push back a little bit that I'm gonna consider these potential risks. So most of these products are not out there yet. So we don't know what they're going to be. And so we're talking about potential risks and potential means that they may not actually materialize. So we're, we're hypothesizing here. And so the three that I'm gonna talk about are, uh, I think from a consumer perspective, the biggest issue for consumers is safety. Consumers want to know that if they purchase a product at the store, that that product is safe to eat, whether that's safe to their, for their family, safe for their kids. Um, and with any new technology, consumers worry about that issue and want an independent assessment that will alleviate those concerns. So whether or not there really are is a food safety risk, when there's something new out there in the food supply, people are concerned, is this safe? And want to be satisfied with, with scientific data that that is the case. Um, the second risk I want to talk about is, you know, when you start growing products outdoors, which we are talking about in an agriculture context, there's always going to be environmental concerns. How does this going to interact with the rest of the environment out there, the agricultural environment and the non-agricultural environment? Will it negatively affect species we care about? Will, it, will there be ecological issues associated with it? And the third issue I want, the risk I wanted to talk about is the, the risk that if we don't get the regulation and governance in, to have the proper balance, that we could use, lose the use of this technology for societal benefits. So I think we've heard in other CRISPR-Con in the earlier weeks that there could be, these could, these, uh, this technology could be used to address climate change, to address the constraints that pre pre prevent farmers from achieving the most, up, most that they can from their land, from their crops, from their animals. Um, and so... But we might not achieve that if, as Sarah mentions, we have a trust issue. And so, so to me, there's a risk that if we don't get the balance correct, the balance in regulation, the balance in governance, the balance in trust, that we might not achieve those. So, so I wanted to raise those three of, of what I think are many potential risks that are out there. Great. Thank you. Salim or Elian, do you want to jump in? Maybe from a EU perspective or trust or other types of concerns that we haven't covered yet? Well, one of the concerns that um, just 
came up thinking just listening to Gregory was this idea of will this increase the asymmetry in terms of the global north and the global south in terms of knowledge that allows uh, production of more food to feed local populations? Will the traits being looked at uh, have an influence on uh, important traits that are important for climate change and for smallholder farmers? Smallholder farmers still feed 75% of the world's population. And so how is that uh, benefiting the smallholder farmers in the world? And, and how is that being articulated in, in terms of the products that are coming to market or not? And how is that giving them uh, more freedom in terms of the choices they have? or locking them into partnerships that may decrease their freedom. Salim, I'd like to hear your perspective on this wide range of concerns, all the way from the risks of lost benefits to food safety and trust, and how well we're doing managing those, either at the global level or EU level or, or other country level. Um, how well do you think we're doing on either regulating the safety concerns or managing these other types of concerns? Yeah, thank you, Jennifer. It's true that for me, uh, I wouldn't answer from a kind of a substantive point of view on, on one category of risk, but more on the procedural dimension. And for me, the biggest risk would be to maintain a kind of institutional void in the sense of a lack of agreed uh, structures and rules on how to, to genome gene editing should be governed beyond even the, the risk uh, dimensions. And, and here we have to recognize that uh, there is still a lot of discontent regarding the lack of perceived authority uh, of the regulatory agency in terms that would be seen as trustworthy and which decision is based on a, a, a full uh, and open and transparent uh, discussion. And, and I mean, there is a lot of hype around uh, gene editing and the recent Nobel Prize will likely reinforce this. And uh, obviously with that comes a lot of promotion of expectations, which is a common feature in the uh, development of, uh, of science and technology project with enormous economic and social benefits that are, uh, are being promise, promised and advances that are also presented as really radical breakthrough of, uh, far-reaching in the way uh, uh, in their application and also revolutionary in, in their consequences. So this way of presenting things, I think, adds to the confusion uh, on, and this lack of perceived authority because it's hard to understand how something that is presented as so revolutionary could escape from any kind of societal and governmental oversight. So I think... The challenge for me is to find uh, scientific and political institution capable of initiating the forms of deliberation that is required uh, by this new technology, which means the ability to integrate multiple perspectives and multiple points of view. And for now, uh, at what we can see, it's, uh, it's quite hard to move away from a very polarized discussion. So I think the challenge is still ahead of us uh, uh, on this uh, matter. Mm -hmm. So how, how do we do that? I'm wondering if any of the panelists have, um, I, I'm hearing some ideas about better participation. So one question is how, is, how are the levels of current participation, public participation in either regulatory decisions or broader governance decisions in your country or in the domain that you're working in? And what suggestions do you have for improving that? So I really appreciate the efforts made by the Convention on Biodiversity in terms of having an Africa group look at uh, sequence data, look at gene editing, look at uh, genetic data and, and, and how does that work in terms of regulatory frameworks in the developing world? And how do we look at indigenous knowledge in this framework and, and how to make sure that there is enough awareness and knowledge for local decision makers to have um, fact-based decision-making happening? And I think it's really important to ensure that the uh, availability of knowledge information to ensure that proper frameworks are in place and so that's one of the elements that I see that is really important. And in, in that perspective, also uh, the work that's being done 
by the FAO is really important in terms of access to seeds. So, so these are the kind of things that I find are, are really critical. And Greg, what about at the U.S. excellent perspective, um, Elian? And, and Greg, what about at the U.S. level? How well are we doing with that, either in regulatory systems or in, in governance? Well, well, I mean, I think public participation in regulation in the U.S. is a mixed bag. Um, I think we've gotten better at it over the years and we continue to get better at it, but I think we still have a ways to go. And so, you know, historically, public participation has only been the kind period where somebody could write a written comment to an agency. And that works and, and it provides a number of stakeholders. And I think that the agencies get a broad perspective of the positions out there on different issues went through that. But uh, you know, agencies have gotten better. I just saw a traceability proposal that just went out from FDA and they are required to have three virtual hearings. I mean, they would have had those hearings in public. And so they're required as part of the record to have three hearings and agencies we see are doing more hearings. And a lot of those hearings are being held outside of the United States. We've seen hearings that the USDA has done in other places in the country to try to get farmers, whether that's in Sacramento, California, or in the Midwest. So there's been some movement outside and, and the hearings and meetings that they're doing are more discussion oriented. It's not just get up and make a presentation, but the agency listens as people around a table have conversations and takes notes about that and that adds to their knowledge. So so we've seen some ways that they have begun to, to make an effort to, to broaden uh, the perspectives that they get. Uh, the final comment I'd say is, you know, We've seen also, you know, dockets with two, three hundred thousand comments submitted. You know, the U.S. Bioengineer Disclosure Rule had thousands of comments from individuals. So, you know, in the past, historically, comments have primarily come in from stakeholders. Let's call them uh, NGO groups like myself, or or trade associations like Sarah's group and others, who I do think represent a lot of different perspectives out there. But but they didn't get them from average citizens, and we've seen more of that. Um, could we do more on all that? Sure. There's always an off play about time and money and, and getting to a decision. The one thing I would say is I think the regulatory environment is narrow. I mean, the questions that agencies look at are primarily questions of safety. And many of the comments that come in are broader questions about, as Celine gets to, you know, should we use these technologies and what are the broad impacts of those? And, and we have a good mechanism to have a discussion about those at the policy level. Um, we are good at saying this particular product is safe or that particular product is safe, but we don't look at, well, what are, if we move into this space of having all these products, you know, on the landscape, what will be the impacts of those? It's not fair to have them, uh, that those impacts be delegated to one particular product um, because it's going to be caused by, by, by the, by the range of products, but we don't have a good mechanism. And I think, so the public, I think gets frustrated with the, regulatory public comment process because a lot of their concerns aren't things that are really relevant to the statutes. So Jennifer, if I can, and um, sure, please. particularly when we're thinking about some of the new regulations that have come out of USDA uh, recently with regard to biotechnology and plants, um, I think one of the things that I would point out is it, it, it's also incumbent upon us as industry and working together if we have uh, commonalities and things that we're concerned about to really elevate those so that the perspective is coming from a diverse set of stakeholders. And um, Greg and I were able to work together on, to, on, on something like that um, under the umbrella of USDA's regulation. So I think one thing that, that could benefit um, the regulatory system is if these Traditionally, disparate actors are coming together and coming forward with an important idea um, for the technology to flourish that we're that we're doing that collectively. And then, as in the case um, that happened uh, on this issue, if that ultimately, if that um, suggestion or recommendation is not adopted by the regulatory system, how do we still how do we still continue to push forward with that idea? So I think that kind of spans between what we're getting out of the regulatory system, but what we know the marketplace or what actors and stakeholders are demanding. So how are we taking that information and that um, and that collective effort and pushing it forward, even if we don't get what we want from the regulatory system? Um, and I think that that's going to be really important as well. So I can... Um refer here to, I mean, uh, in France, uh, I, I think the idea of having something more inclusive approach of regulation as something deliberative, a learning process that improves also 
anticipation and reflect on the diversity of societal values, needs, and, and, and concern. Uh, that could take several forms. And uh, in France, uh, we had that kind of uh, the chance to have this uh, establishment in 2008, if I'm not wrong, of this uh, High Council on Biotech, which has two different uh, sub bodies, one the Scientific Council, and, and one which is this uh, Committee on uh, Economic, Ethical, and, and, and Society, uh, which is composed mainly of different stakeholder groups, uh, almost 30 different uh, groups. And there we had a chance to have for two years uh, a long deliberation, and it was even before the, the decision of the uh, European Court of uh, Justice uh, about the, the regulation of uh, gene editing product. And, and uh, it's true that uh, uh, within that uh, committee, uh, we have been able to, to discuss issues which are generally hidden uh, dimension uh, on the controversy that, and for which, um, and, and beyond the usual disciplines that are uh, usually mobilized to deal with the, the subject. So uh, it was a major step forward, I think, uh, in terms of uh, creating a new public space and address issues that are usually not addressed, like uh, impact of intellectual property, the diversity of production model, traceability issues, equity. But it was also a mixed uh, kind of um, outcome because as I said, at the same time, uh, there was another body discussing on, let's say, real stuff. The, the scientific, what is seen as the only scientific valid dimension, which is the genetic dimension, and, and, uh, and uh, with a risk-based uh, approach, uh, with a prob probabilistic uh, style of reasoning about those risks. And that was seen as... The, the the legitimate uh, the, the, the 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 legitimate voice of uh, uh, for the regulatory body and and whatever we have discussed and done in this other uh, council was seen more as a kind of add-on a commentary to that kind of uh, uh, um, truth that was uh, coming out of this uh, other committee. So there was still a, a, a huge asymmetry in terms of um, power and, and capacity to influence the, the decision. And, and um, I, I think that echoes some, something probably where uh, science as an institution, as an organization, uh, should uh, weigh in and try to also do its part of the job by refusing or at least allowing more uh, a diversity of discipline to and, and views and styles of, of, of reasoning and uh, approaches and level of observation. So all that diversity, which is contained in within um, scientific organization, are usually not really uh, um, at least. Uh, those scientific organizations tend to align uh, uh, more easily to the usual uh, expertise that is requested from them on those topics rather than trying to uh, import, I mean, introduce within their own kind of uh, organization this uh, the democratic uh, and more open discussion. And that's, I think, something that is uh, to, something to work on. Um, like more de more democracy inside. Just to pick up on what Salim just yes. said, uh, as a member of the African Academy of Sciences, uh, the, the 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 members will comment on on different issues to support policymaking. And and one of the efforts that is being made within the academy is how do we bring the experts in in, in technology as well as social scientists to reflect together so that we actually have transdisciplinary. Um, commentary that can be more useful to policymakers that looks at different lenses. So, so that's, I think that's really something that needs to be made more so that there isn't more power driven on one side that is the technology that can bring profit, but also look at the other consequences in terms of human capital, social capital, and natural capital, and the effects on those. That's wonderful. Sarah, do you think a process such as that, that Elian just described, would increase trust, which you identified as kind of the, the number one risk? Um, I, 
I do. And I appreciate those comments. I think, um, you know, the, as we've thought about the, the voices that need to be in the conversation, I think there's been a real um, pause and, and realization by industry that this isn't just about the kinds of scientists that are represented here today. Um, and that the, it, it, we only stand to benefit from more of those ideas and that diversity of perspectives being included when we're thinking about putting technology into the marketplace or really answering the question, like you said, around the why are we using the technology? Those are all legitimate, consistent questions that we're hearing. I think information is more widely available to consumers now than it was when transgenic technology started coming into the marketplace. So it's only logical that there's going to be a diversity of questions and a diversity of perspectives um, facing facing us as, as industry as we look to put these beneficial technologies into the marketplace. So certainly appreciate that. And, um, and I think it's something that Bio has also tried to really be conscious of doing at our own convening events is not just take... Um, the plant biologists or the molecular biologists um, or the marine biologists and put them on a panel, but really start expanding um, the disciplines that are represented in our conversations and, and use that as a model um, for other industries. So thank you for that. Well, Greg, I think we're still faced with the challenge, though, that a lot of our formal decision making, kind of where the rubber hits the road on a go, no go decision is limited by particular statutes um, on, on what we can, what types of risk we can consider, even whether benefits are considered, which I'd love to hear more about as well from each of you. But so we're limited by these statutes, but yet there's this desire to broaden these inclusive and participatory processes and, and bring in a more diverse set of disciplines. So can you comment on that tension a bit and, and, and maybe what are we limited to in regulatory decisions for current gene edited foods and, and, and perhaps where might that tension exist when it comes to the uncertainty of the potential risks or societal implications? Um, thank you, Jennifer. Yes, you're correct. I mean, the reality is, is that, you know, in most countries, and I'm going to talk about the United States, but we have legislatures and legislatures pass laws and those laws uh, are implemented through the executive branch, through different agencies. And those laws are fairly specific about what the agencies are supposed to do. And, and so most of those laws that we're talking about here are laws to protect, you know, human and animal health or the, or, or the, or to protect the environment. And so, and those are what we call the safety issues. And so the agencies are really limited in making a determination as to a, whether a particular product that's before them is safe, whether it's safe to eat, safe for animals, or safe for the environment. And and so there may be other issues about social, you know, um, equity issues. There may be issues about you know how this is going to change the landscape of rural America, things like that. Those are important issues. But from the agency's point of view, they're very limited in looking at a science risk assessment based view of looking at, you know, is this product safe? And I'm first one to say that that's really important. I think that's almost the sort of entry point, you know, in my, my perspective from uh, CSBI is, you know, if it's not safe to eat, we can't talk about societal benefits or all kinds of other things. That's sort of the, that's sort of the minimum standard. We first got to meet that safety issue before we can even talk about whether it's going to benefit climate change or other types of things, because it, yes, it might have a great benefit for climate change, but if it's also going to put people in the hospital, I'm not going to support that. And, uh, and I don't think that the agencies want that or the public wants that uh, and somebody to make an assessment of whether the benefits of climate change outweigh the fact that some people are going to get allergenic reactions and and go into the hospital for something. So so I think we have there's a role for agencies to play. What I see in the public comment period and other things is when people have these other concerns when there's no other form for them, they come into the public participation. They come in by the back door. So people may say that a genetically engineered animal is unsafe. They really don't have evidence of it being unsafe, but they're uncomfortable of it for ethical reasons or for social reasons or because it's not going to be labeled and it isn't transparent and they can't choose whether to buy it in the marketplace. And so in some ways that all comes in, which makes the regulators uh, job difficult because they you know, have to say no to those people, you know, I'm not going to consider your point of view because they're limited in what they can do. And so then people lose credit, in some ways the regulatory agencies lose credibility. So I've been one who's advocated that we should keep the regulation and the, those decisions very science-based, risk-based, 
in one part of the government. And then we should have other parts of the government, committees like Salim's talking about or other places where we can have these broader policy discussions, which I think, you know, policymakers and, and the public can make and we can bring in lots of other people. But it's, you know, I'll give one example. You know, the question is, is the genetically engineered or gene edited animal safe? That's a safety question. Do we want to do this because of ethical reasons or human animal welfare reasons or other things are completely different issues. And so we have to separate those. If we bring them together, then we all, everything loses credibility because the regulatory system is making decisions that people don't know. Are you basing it on science? Are you basing it on uh, an eth ethical viewpoint or something else? Salim? Uh, please. Yeah, can I react on that? Because I'm not sure that I, I share this view that I mean, this kind of, um, how you say that in English, sorry. Uh, anyway, this uh, uh, the, the science-based argument, I think I have some difficulties with that because science is not a monolithic. Uh, and and uh, I mean, we have plenty of example of how science can be strategically used uh, for 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 justifying preformed decision in the political arena and or or ignore if it run uh, against uh, the interest of uh, some po political decision so and but beyond even this kind of cynical perspective about the use of science just from a more ontological perspective science uh, calling upon science based decision give the wrong impression that there is one unified science able to to deliver the truth and this ignore the fact that there are multiple uh, science discipline uh, multiple reasoning style multiple level of observations multiple uh, uh, horizon i mean time horizons uh, on which to to build evidence and 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 uh, about the, the 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 very same uh, uh, issue, so uh, I, I'm afraid that when we say science based, we reinforce this idea that uh, we see only the genetic dimension and the safety issue related to that as the only legitimate science able to provide uh, um, sound advice, sound evidence. Whereas for me, we can do sound science on the impact of intellectual property rights. We can do sound science on equity issue. We can do sound science and build evidence on, on other dimensions that are not necessarily as, uh, I mean, uh, should be pushed to something that is value laden and, and uh, uh, not uh, objective in the way that we conceive uh, the genetic aspect and the risk assessment uh, uh, dimension. So I'm, I, I really feel strongly about that, the, the need to, to build a more pluralistic view about science and how science could contribute to, uh, 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 to this discussion. Um, so Lee, I just hope, I hope I wasn't misunderstood. I'm not suggesting at all that you can't use science to address many of those other questions that you're suggesting. I think there's lots of very good science out there that can be used to address those questions. But many of those questions aren't what the regulators are asked to do. The regulator is asked and FDA is to determine yeah. if right. this is safe to oh, eat. Maybe. And that should be a science-based decision whether or not it's safe to eat. Sure. And I do believe okay. there's good yeah. science out there to determine if something is safe to eat. Um, and I think that that's sure. really needed for consumers and others. But there are, I, I didn't, don't get me wrong, that there isn't lots of other science and that okay. science doesn't deal with the yeah. social or other I kinds see of Sarah issues. Wanted, yeah. yeah, yeah, go ahead. Sarah. So as you say, for, certainly from, a, from an industry perspective, that, that science-based risk-appropriate regulatory agenda in the United States is critical to our members. Um, you know, as Greg said, um, you know, we really count on that government uh, assessment and that and that strong regulatory approach that science-based and risk appropriate for, for our membership as well. Um, I think, you know, certainly when you look at what USDA has done and their modernized regulatory approach, that's, that's reflective of decades of science. And we want to make sure that we're, um, that we're being forward about that and that the, the legitimacy of those science-based regulations is something that the public understands. Um, I do agree that there is, uh, there's a need to, um, to have conversations and to have evidence-based discussions around some of those other issues. But, but for us that, 
keeping the government as a science and risk appropriate um, arbiter of the technology is critical for the predictability, for investment, and for a number of aspects that our that our companies are looking at. Great. So I'm a member of the Society for Risk Analysis, and sometimes even members of that society say risk assessment is more an art than a science. And, you know, sometimes setting your endpoints, what you care about is value-laden for what endpoints you're looking at, where you draw the line for a standard is value-laden. Um, so I, I think this is a great discussion about kind of the intersection of science and values, and is there a dichotomy? And Elian, you talked about the process that in that you were using to bring the two together. And so I'm wondering if you have any comments about this area yeah. as well. well the issue of values is a really important one. And, and for me, it really comes down to what are we using science for? Are we using it to increase profits of corporations? Or are we using it to for the betterment of society, the betterment of humanity, for fighting climate change, for increasing biodiversity in the world? And so part of it is what is it we value and who shapes what we value? And so who's doing the research towards the types of products that are coming to market? And who will they benefit in priority? And so part of it is how do we have science serve the greater good? Because there's so many ways technology can, can exist for technology itself. But that does not necessarily mean that the value of human dignity is being considered in terms of what is being brought to market and how that actually helps solve the big challenges of how do we feed a growing population uh, that is 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 uh, is facing with COVID uh, a lot of issues related to access to food, especially in the global south. So, so for me, it's really how do we have science align with uh, values of shared uh, interconnectedness on the planet, and how who we are, what we do affects everything, affects nature, affects biodiversity, affects the safety of all our systems. And, and what are the risks we're willing to take to use technology in ways that are clearly uh, able to increase profit, but how do we ensure that they're increasing social good at the same time? Which kind of is a lead into one of the other questions we had on our list was about benefits and, and should benefits be considered in a formal regulatory process. Certainly they're considered in a broader or should be considered in a broader governance process. But what about regulatory statutes and, and risk benefits? Some of them, at least in the US, you can include benefits, some not. And so do, does anyone else have a comment on that in the, the social good nature of different gene edited products and whether that should be a part of regulatory affairs? Well, at Bio, you know, as I said, we're when we think about the regulatory system, we are thinking about those science-based uh, safety uh, stewardship questions that we that we've talked about. I think the the question around benefits, um, thinking about in a couple ways. One is if there's a desire to have an independent verification of benefits of the technology, so that it's not just industry coming forward and saying this product is good for these reasons and that there is, um, there's a desire by others to say, we'd like to have that checked out, whether those benefits are potential because the product is still in development or real. That's a conversation that we're willing to have. And I think that that's come up um, a number of times in our stakeholder engagement. And it's something that um, Bio and its members are, are anxious to talk about. Um, I also think as far as benefits goes, when we're talking about, you know, how important it is to talk about the benefits of the technology, whether that's for, um, you know, nutritional reasons or sustainability reasons or animal welfare reasons that we've actually taken and developed a, a number of platforms to have that benefits driven conversation where there could be a dialogue and there could be a diversity of perspectives involved, um, sort of tangential to those more scientific regulatory questions. Uh, we've launched a project called Innovature. Um, that is strictly dedicated to talking about the benefits of gene editing and food and agriculture across our planet, our health, and our environment. We have our own growing trust and innovation web hub where we're having a benefits-driven uh, conversation and talking about things around transparency. So I do think it's critical that we're coming together to have these benefits focused um, and, and definitely welcome more conversation about how we could 
have those benefits um, be verified and build more trust around understanding what those benefits are and who's receiving the benefit. Is it just a farmer? Is it a company? Or is it um, is it vulnerable populations? Is it the environment? I think those are all going to be really important to have an open dialogue about. Um, Jennifer, I would agree with you that you know our regulatory system, some of our statutes do allow benefits to be addressed out, and uh, you know in the environmental area in particular, we generally look at a cost benefit analysis and we look at the benefits, and that makes a lot of sense because you know when we're substituting. If we're deciding, oh, do we approve this pesticide, this new pesticide, we have to look at, well, how does it compare to what the farmers are currently doing? And will it, you know, will it be less harmful to some insects than the current pesticide that it's going to replace? And so that should factor into this, into the conversation. And so I think there are lots of places where it's very important because, you know, the environment's constantly changing. And so if we, you can't just look at what the, uh, what the safety of it is. You also have to look at what the benefits are. That is harder in areas of food, you know, where I think that, you know, we're not very comfortable with our uh, government deciding, well, there's this nutritional benefit, but there's this allergenetic allergenicity harm. And we're going to off play, you know, number of people in hospitals versus number of people extended life because of less heart disease or something like that. And so I think in some of our statutes, we do have sort of a safety. We first achieve some level of safety before we look at benefits into an analysis. And I think in some cases that is correct way to do it. But that's different than talking, as Sarah said, about well, still looking at those societal benefits and having a decision just because a product safe doesn't mean it should move forward onto the market. Um, and so should those go onto the market and what are the benefits and which products should we, I think as Eliana said, you know, how do we figure out from the beginning when we're in the development stage, which are the products that are really going to help the, the, the better, the, the greater good? And how do we get those to be the ones how do we get those to be the kind of things that the technology moves forward with? Great. Go ahead, Salim. And then we're and then after this, we're going to move to some audience questions. Yeah, no, Salim it, or Alian, if you have comments on this. Yeah, no, just to, to reflect on that, because I, I also chaired the, the working group in this high council on, on biotech on, on socioeconomic impact. And the very first question that we uh, have put in our kind of grid of analysis on, on socioeconomic impact was really this question of the so uh, the, the benefits and 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 by asking why we need uh, to be more explicit about why we need it in the first place such a technology to address what kind of issue and and it's not because something is feasible that is de desirable so i think it's very important to 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 uh, think about that and and not just I mean and and also wonder uh, uh, whether this technology is the best way to achieve that particular goal also because that what are the alternative solutions that are uh, that may exist to address to address uh, this uh, particular problem that uh, genome editing could uh, help resolving. So I think those kind of uh, opening up the, the field of possible uh, solution is uh, really important also, even as a way to, to build uh, trust and tr transparency, I think. So um, yeah, that's... Uh, so I, I really think that this ethical question uh, about the, the, the direction and the, the objective that are pursued uh, behind this, uh, the mobilization of such technology should be addressed. And unfortunately, this is... Uh, and along the, go ahead, Elian. Yeah. yeah, just to build on what Selim was saying, um, because one of the thing, issues is, is what are we spending money in terms of R&D versus what are the urgent needs? And so I, I think about the issue of pesticide, you know, uh, genes related to pesticide resistance. And, and so not only, OK, if we put them in, are we sure that it's not affecting other locations in the genome? And, you know, what are there any risks to be transmitted to wild relatives that can actually change um, biodiversity? And then the alternatives is, you know, what would be the cost to shifting to regenerative agriculture where we would have diverse crops growing together and, 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 and having constant cover that would limit the weeds? And so, so there are different ways of going about it that would actually promote biodiversity preservation, produce safer foods that would not require so much chemical input. And so the tension is, where are we using to use technology 
for the greater good? And does it make sense to push technologies that are, are viable in, in economically uh, sense in terms of, of large farmers that have purchasing power to buy these and, and, and make it easy for them to work in monocrops and, and ways that they can produce large quantities of the same foods, which is needed at the same time uh, for, the, for the 570 million smallholder farmers in the world, what do they need and, and are there ways for them to benefit from these technologies in ways that really serve their needs in terms of feeding their own families and also in being able to access markets and improve their livelihoods. So for me, those are the tensions involved in terms of large market economies versus smallholder farmer based economies, you know, in the sense that they still feed 75% of the planet. So they, they are important, even though economically they do not have the same power that large corporations hold. And actually, we have a question from the audience along those mm -hmm. lines, too, that any of you, it's directed at Elian, but any of you could respond to it. It says, at this point, genome engineering has focused on economically viable crops that often don't reflect the needs of smallholder or the cultural values of smallholder farmers. So how do conversations at, on regulation that focus and empower products produced by large agribusiness translate to underrepresented groups? that traditionally have not been invited to the table. So I guess looking at this intersection between regulation and the empowerment of certain products, um, and are, are they meeting the needs of all types of farmers? Mm -hmm. Any comments on that? No, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead well, Celine. Yeah. Well, no, no, I, I, so I, I, I fully agree and along the line that Eliane has already uh, talked about, I think the one of the highest risk in the, that is that in the current incentive structure from a global perspective and, and the, 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 this uh, re rewarding system of innovation, it's clear that we can expect that innovation derived from gene editing will mainly serve the need of those who are probably already overfed uh, and, and hence, I would say, increase food waste and uh, obesity, all kind of uh, issues that uh, are the hidden cost of this kind of uh, uh, food production system. So uh, rather than tackling, uh, again, from a global perspective, the, 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 the real food security issue faced by the poorest and, and, and the people who need uh, more food. So um, it's, it's very important also to have... Uh, a, some capacity to act on on the incentive structure uh, to to be able to direct those innovation to 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 those uh, underserved needs, and that also goes along with this issue of um, more democracy in 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 the way science is conducted and in the way partnership is built with uh, uh, developing country and with uh, research system in, so in the South. So I would South, just note that from a, from a biotechnology industry perspective, where we're seeing growth in our membership and where some of the newer companies that are that are coming to the table or that we're participating with in different, sec in different venues um, are working in crops that traditionally, you know, were not seen when, with the original um, transgenic technologies. We have companies that are working primarily in the tropics, um, that are trying to uh, tackle crops that are highly susceptible to climate change. So I would say that there is um, that there is a shift happening as far as it's not just you know a few big companies working in a few small crops, and that we are seeing a greater diversity both of the the size and scale of the players, but more importantly, I think in the in the organisms that they're working on across plants and animals and, and microbes. The other thing that I would say is just um, on the issue of of equity and, and how we talk about that. I think um, we have a, a new CEO at, at Bio, Dr. Michelle McMurray Heath, and she said some very, uh, very powerful things around science and justice. And it, it's a pillar of, of her platform at Bio moving forward and really understanding that access to science is, is the definition of justice. So when we think about what it means for, um, you know, 
farmers across the globe or a variety of actors have access to this technology, we really are thinking about it through that equity and justice lens. Um, and I think you'll see, you know, an embracing of more of those, um, more of those smaller companies and more of those diverse companies that are really working on not just the traditional crops that we're used to when we think about biotechnology, but ones that are going to have a direct relationship to people's access to food and, and um, economic well-being. So another question from the audience, it actually relates to a question on our list that we haven't gotten to quite yet is, and, and maybe we'll take both of these at the same time and maybe starting with Greg to respond. Is there anything different for the governance of gene edited crops in compared to conventionally bred crops or to first generation transgenics? And when discussing those risks, is anybody raising awareness about the risks of conventionally bred crops? So kind of now moving a little bit to the comparison of all these issues, safety, equity, governance, in the context of the comparators, either the baseline of conventional crops or the first generation of transgenics. So Greg, do you wanna start us off with a response to that? Sure, I will do that. And um, uh, some people may think my, my, my answer might be a little controversial, but I mean, I think, so there are some, you know, obviously everybody knows the characteristics of gene editing that make that could make governance different than it would be for these other things. You know, it's than GMOs, it's more precise, it's easier to do, it's cheaper to do, so many more companies will be doing it. And so in some sense that might make governance more difficult, it might make it easier, I don't know. Um, when I look at regulation of any, any product, and so I'm not limiting this to GMOs or gene editing or conventional crops, the, quest, the reason to regulate is, uh, the question is, are there potential risks and are there potential risks that regulation would, would be able to manage? And so, um, so that same question, so that, that, so people have applied that to GM crops, they could apply that to gene edited crops. They also could apply that con to conventional crops. So, so I think the problem with the debate that's gone on is people want to put gene edited uh, crops or gene edited products in the category of either a GM or a conventionally bred. And, and they want to say that, well, we haven't regulated conventionally bred or we haven't specifically regulated them in this way in the past. Well, just because we haven't done something in the past doesn't mean we should do it now. I mean, if we don't approve the same, the pesticides we approve today are a lot safer than the pesticides we approved 20, 30, 40 years ago. Some of those products would not be approved today. We've gotten better at doing analysis of how those impact the environment. And so, so the question to me is not, are there, it, it, it's, it's not, do, are the risks of, are, is this more similar to conventional bread than it is to GM? The question is, are there potential risks from gene edited products? And, and are those risks something that we should be regulating and independent of it? And then if they are, then what would be the appropriate regulation for those? And the fact that those risks exist, I think what I saw one of the comments in the stage was that, you know, well, these, you know, we, we haven't regulated conventional crops and they have risks and that's right. And so maybe we should go back if there are conventional crops that have risks. And I see Salim, you know, nodding there that have caused lots of both, you know, environmental problems or social problems or other things. Maybe we should go back and, and look at those. So, so to me, the issue isn't, do we put it in one bucket or the other bucket, but we should actually look at it indirectly as what that is. The final thing I want to say that I don't want to take too much time is, is that all gene edited products aren't the same. And so I think we have to look at regulation and this in, in a proportionate way. And so there are differences here. And we've had the, you know, we've had the problem in the GM technology debate and in the discussion about GM and in conventionally bred, we put everything into one bucket um, and we put gene editing into one bucket, but there's lots of things. We can delete a, you know, a single base pair and silence one gene, or we can make a gene drive um, and, and, and push a whole new phenotype into the environment. Uh, beyond Mendelian and genetics. And so those are very, very different. So I think we run the risk when we talk about these technologies and these products, putting them in generic things when in reality are, this is a technology that has many different applications. And when, it, when we come to both regulation as well as governance, we have to look at those in subsets. We can't look at them in a all or nothing okay. kind of category. Yeah, and the issue, about that is that increases the complexity of international negotiation and agreements because then that creates subcategories that need to be looked at and may require different frameworks. And so part of it is technology is advancing at such an accelerated rate 
how can we create spaces for the regulatory frameworks to advance well, but advance at a rhythm that that allows us to keep up with technology? And, and so the issue of how technology is speeding ahead and the regulatory framework is burdened by the layers that we need to go through is a really critical one because at the end, what happens in terms of how much is being invested to create profit versus how much is invested for good I mean, there are choices that need to be made about how we're using these technologies and how they will contribute and what are the risks associated with the players in terms of industry players that are coming in and and, and making decisions on where will you have the most clear framework to be able to have a clear pathway to business. And so those are the tensions that are coming in play as the complexity of the science increases. Sarah Salim, any comments on the? Okay, uh, we'll take another question from from the audience, uh, which is, "What is your view?" And this is for anyone. What is your view on the need to internationally harmonize the way that risk assessors approach safety of gene edited foods? So, as you may know, and right now we're headed for probably another trade war. Um, and and <laughs> but um, would any of you like to comment on um, the need to internationally harmonize the risk assessment and safety approaches to gene edited foods? No. Do we think well, it's important I, or not? I mean, I'll, 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 I'll take a try. Okay, I mean, I, I think you know. We always there's I think there's historically there's always been advantage to having you know uh, harmonized approaches for determining whether a product is safe, uh, whether that's a pesticide or a gene edited food or a, a, another type of food. I think there's advantages of if there is an international consensus that can be arised as to how to do that assessment and the data that could be needed. I think that's very beneficial. I think that's different than a harmonized approach as to whether or not those products are adopted. So I think we can come up with whether we agree of the safety of them, but that doesn't mean that everybody will have the same level of safety. Every country will have the same level of comfort with having that product, even though it is found safe. And, you know, the example, we go to the GM in the GM area, you know, EFSA and the European Union has made the same determinations that the U.S. has made about GM crops. Uh, those are grown in the United States and those are not grown in Europe. Um, so it isn't an issue of the harmonized risk assessors approach. They have harmonized how they're doing the risk assessment, but we've also given countries the flexibility and the ability politically and socially and otherwise to make, make look at that same data, look at that other thing and say, well, we still don't want this or we want this. And so, so I just wanna qualify the answer to that is there's one thing to come to some agreement on how to do some of the science around risk assessment that not necessarily harmonized in terms of everybody agreeing that this product should be on the market and 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 adopted. So part of my perspective on this comes from uh, my history in working for a company that exported grain, right? So when I when I think kind of about the just actual value chain concerns around harmonized um, regulatory systems or you know a, a consistent science based regulatory system at some level internationally, there are real business and risk implications there, right? So. Um, if you're exporting crops and there are, you know, different regulatory systems, you know, you run the risk of a, a tremendous cost and, and loss um, that way, which is, is real for a lot of companies. Also on the animal side, too, you know, if we think about um, moving protein around the world, that's going to be a, a really important thing to understand, particularly in some of those more nascent technologies that don't have 20 years worth of a regulatory system to, to look back on. So I think, you know, bio works really closely, um, not only within our international team, but with with the international aspects of U.S. government to make sure that, um, you know, we're promoting a, a science based and risk appropriate uh, regulatory system globally so that more countries do have access to the technology, whether that's from just a, a product perspective or just kind of fundamentally from from an access to the technology perspective. Well, and actually, we, we have at least a, a framework, which is the Cartagena Protocol, that uh, deals with some, that provides that minimum level of risk assessment to allow international exchange of, of uh, GMO. Or, or, and, but the, the question is, uh, obviously, also how to include 
other dimension than and and uh, especially the social social economic dimension and there is a whole article uh, foreseen in that uh, protocol that is still very much uh, um, not resolved and and there are a lot of tension there in terms of agreeing on a minimum issue to be considered uh, 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 whereas I think it's it's part of this uh, kind of global equity to be able to um, to put that uh, on the table and, and 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 discuss and cover those issues uh, internationally. I would just uh, respond to that, Salim, and, and I think Eliana made this point. Elian made this point earlier. Yeah. Uh, the problem with some of those coordinated protocol and some of those things is they move very, very slowly and they don't really adopt the technology very well and they're not very flexible. Yeah. And so, you know, while I I agree that that document is a good document and it sets a good uh, international standard, um, it's a very slow process. And so these technologies are moving very, very fast. And if we want them, uh, and so who moves fastest? Uh, Sarah's bio companies, they are the ones who move fastest. And where does the fastest move? Into the biggest markets, the ones that have the most money and the biggest. And so they leave out those smallholder farmers. They leave out other other parties of small crops, other things that uh, might be very beneficial. Um, and so I think that's that's something we just have to sort of keep in mind. Now, there's a very specific question about the Cartagena Protocol, and it says, what is the panelist's view on the uptake and proliferation of the Argentinian approach in line with the Cartagena Protocol definition of new combinations of DNA throughout Latin America? Is this indeed desirable and conducive to a level playing field? Can any of you comment on that question, or is it beyond... Um, I mean, I'm happy to do it. It's very much a regulatory question. So, um, I mean, I think the Argentinian system is a one and one way to uh, interpret the Cardinal Protocol's definitions. I think it is a reasonable interpretation. Could you clarify what that interpretation is for the audience, Greg? So, so the definition of, of modern biotechnology and a GMO really comes down to whether there's a novel uh I forget what the words are in front of me exactly here, but a, a novel addition of, of DNA. And so the question is whether uh, a genome edited crop that only has a deletion or a substitution is considered a novel addition, or whether the definition of the fact that you use recombinant DNA is the most telling thing. So for many definitions around the country, if you use recombinant DNA, which in most cases is what's used in gene editing, then the product could be a, a GMO. If it's if you're really linking it to whether in the end the final product has a novel combination of new DNA, then uh, some deletions or substitutions or things might not have that. They might not be considered a novel combination of that. And so they then so they look at that question and make a decision whether or not that product is regulated as a GMO, not whether it's regulated at all, but whether it's regulated as a GMO. And so I think that is a re reasonable regulatory system that they set up for their definitions and how they've done things. That may not be what other countries are doing. The one other comment I'd have on the on the Argentinian regulatory system for this particular thing is it is not very transparent. So they've had many decisions that they've made and nobody can see those decisions or the data that was used to make those decisions. And so I think that's going to be problematic as we move to trade and those products getting to market. So so they have a lot of products that have gone through that system that are genome edited, and they've told the researchers these are not regulated as a GMO, but they haven't alerted the public to what those are. And so there, to me, that's a big concern when we talk about trust and we talk about markets um, that they haven't done in that system. It's kind of separate from the specific Cartagena protocol question. It brings up some really interesting questions about just general competitiveness about the innovation ecosystem. And and, you know, when we think about faults within our own regulatory system here in the U.S., one of the things that we point to as industry is that if, if the U.S. regulatory system either can't keep pace with innovation, like we've mentioned a number of times, or is, is overly burdensome or isn't, you know, risk proportionate, that companies will take the technology and invest in other countries. And, and what are the implications there for, you know, the strengths of the bioeconomy and its ability to create jobs and tackle 
problems if investment is constantly moving. So I think that that's just something else to think about when we look at the the global landscape is um, if we have this very disparate landscape of regulatory systems, what are the implications there for um, where companies are investing and, um, and what that means for access to technology? So we also have a question about in, in, with regard to governance and labeling and standards here today. So do you think um, it's for Sarah and, and others, though, to talk about this particular issue? How will bio facilitate trust building and transparency around gene edited foods when the recent in the U.S. national bioengineered food disclosure standard and does not necessarily include for gene edited foods? Yeah. And then I would just welcome comment from any of you on the labeling, traceability, and trust issues? Yeah, thanks for that question. So certainly, um, as, as we went out and kind of asked um, stakeholders, and I alluded to this when I first um, introduced myself, kind of what those questions were, um, the questions we get more often than not are, is the product safe? Where is it? And how will I know where it is? And certainly, you know, consumers having the ability to know is something that is important to, to Bio and its members. Um, so what we are focused on right now as part of our broader transparency initiative is really um, working directly with food companies and with retailers and with groups that represent consumers. Um, Greg just spoke on a panel at, at our recent event that was entirely consumer focused to really get at how can we work with industry and those groups to provide consumers with the information that they're looking for, sort of outside the scope of the, the law, um, you know, there are a number of ways, whether that's through digital disclosure, we heard a lot of really positive comments about things like smart label in the United States. Um, how can we how can we work together to make sure that um, consumers can get the information that they want? So that's certainly on our radar to tackle. I think, um, again, there are a number of ways to get at that. Some of those can also involve partnerships with the government um, in, in promoting that um, in, in promoting the access to information. I also think just generally when I think about labeling, oftentimes we think about that as a sort of a, a consequence that happens like, oh, you have to label and really changing the mindset about labeling or providing information via a label to really be an opportunity to educate consumers about technology. I think um, we know that there's a, a big knowledge gap around gene editing around biotechnology and food generally. People know a little bit, but they don't um, They don't necessarily know the whole picture. And our technology developers are eager to tell that story because it has a, there are some really positive attributes to, um, to some of these new technologies and, and the problems that they're trying to solve. So what we're doing is trying to flip the, the labeling conversation and instead of it being something that we have to do, thinking about it as an opportunity to work with those important partners in the, in the value chain to tell a positive and more holistic story about the technology. I would just flag, Jennifer, that I think that issue is not just an issue the U.S. is going to face. There are a lot of other countries that that have are beginning to think about what is their regulatory system going to look like for gene ed, genome edited products. Um, they're first tackling that issue, and then their secondary issue will be whether those are labeled or disclosed, or how will information be made available to those. And again, they may choose not to uh, they may choose to be consistent. If it's, uh, they don't label it as a GMO, they also don't label it as genome edited, but they may also may choose to not regulate it as a genome edited product, but also but still label it uh, in a similar fashion because consumers want that information or they want to be transparent about it. So, so I think this is an issue that I think many countries will grapple with. Okay. Well, we have an interesting question here, bringing us back to the issue of the intersection of science and values. Um, so when you do bring in, the audience member asks, when one brings in ethical issues around some of these topics, how do you assure a separation of church and state? And, and they ask, due to the observation that some groups seem to follow dogma outside of any evidence to the contrary, and is this religion in many ways? So intersection of governance, values, and science, and religion, which we haven't talked about religion. So that's an interesting, anybody want to tackle that? I think it's an interesting question. But. Well, I, I think going back to what Sarah was saying earlier around 
trust. You know, we started out around the issue of trust. How do you create a, a framework of trust? There's the issue of how do you create a framework of trust? How do we create a framework of uh, dialogue so people have enough scientific understanding of what happens and the risks associated to safety? But at the same time, you know, if we're talking about religion, religion is, is the politics of spirituality. So how are we bringing in the politics of spirituality and, and ethical values into this, this whole space? So it really comes down to what is our purpose in bringing this to market? Is it to make more money? Is it to feed more people? Is it to feed more people safely? Because those are different, they're not necessarily the same thing. Is it to make to, to feed more people safely while in decreasing the carbon footprint on the planet? So the complexity of the framework will increase as we add more data to the questioning. And so it's really important to create space for dialogue. Dialogue in itself creates place opportunity for people to, to voice their concerns and to be heard. And, and that's one issue in itself around politics is, is the desire to be heard or, you know, it, it, there's something it's like if, if you ex, if, if you exclude me, I will resist you. I don't know. There's, there's this. Uh, mm -hmm. um, and, and this idea is how do we create enough space for people to feel hurled for the science to be clearly shared in ways that uh, the public understands it without jargon? And, and how do we ensure that we're putting in enough elements to understand what are the specific consequences of the technology to the environment and to social and human dynamics? And so, so how do we create that framework so that people can make really informed decisions that aren't coming out of a place of fear? And so that's where I would say would be really important. Great. Okay, there's one question for Salim from the audience on the specifics of the HCB recent, recently issued a notice on genome edited plants. What do you think its influence is currently worth given its history over the past decade? So moving back to more specifics, right? Yeah, well, I will be short, but uh, yes, indeed, the HCB I presented the, the the, the bright side of it, but I mean, uh, obviously, it, it is currently in a big turmoil uh, because there are big fights between different ministries about uh, its fate, and uh, people think that uh, it has not delivered uh, because precisely, probably because of this, I think, misdesign as, that I mentioned earlier, this fact of, of separating the, those two uh, issues was probably thought as a good idea because it, it has indeed created new space, but it has also show, shown that uh, uh, there was one probably a, a kind of asymmetry uh, that was maintained and that has generated a lot of tensions and that has weakened over time uh, the, the ability uh, of the HCB to conduct its work and, and to really uh, have a voice in uh, an influence in any decision. So there are currently discussion in the government on how to proceed with that organization, institution. And uh, I don't have any information so far, but it may be, uh, um, how do you say that, um, uh, Collapse, or, or I, I don't know. I don't have any uh, information at this stage. We haven't met for now almost one year and a so half. So let's do a round so robin with uh, two mm. final questions here. The first being, maybe in a sentence or two, how do each of you think, if, the, if, if you're a person, a public member, not necessarily a stakeholder or in, really heavily engaged in this issue, but how can you engage if you care about it? How should the public engage or how can a person engage with this issue? So maybe starting with um, whoever's ready. This is an uh, audience member question. How can a person engage? Well, I think part of it is, is, is showing up here and listening to these types of discussions. It's important because part of it is, is, is being informed enough to make uh, decisions that are based on facts. I think that's really important. 
And then to have clarity, what are the values that are important for you in terms of this technology and what is it being used for? And does it line with your values? So part of it is some people want cheaper food. Some people want the safest food possible. And, and then there's tensions in between. Some people want to contribute to food systems that are ensuring that the most marginalized also have access and have dignified livelihoods. So part of it is understanding what are your value systems and how are you engaging to ensure you have adequate facts, that you have uh, data that reflects the science and, and reflects the, the, the risks and also reflects your own desires in terms of economically, socially, humanly, and in terms of your uh, environmental concerns that what you're doing aligns with who you are at all those levels. I think consumers and the public have a, a tremendous amount of power and it shouldn't be underestimated, right? So your, your purchasing decisions, um, the comments you're making to food companies about your, your values and how that's reflected in, in what you want to buy, your engagement with us on social media, your engagement with my member companies on social, you know, in a variety of ways that that's tremendously powerful. Your engagement with lawmakers tremendously powerful. So I, I think, you know, I agree. The more that you can make your voice heard in those venues, those conversations, while you as an individual might not think it matters, those collective conversations come all the way back up to the to the technology developers and how they look at where they're investing and the kinds of partnerships and the kinds of unique trust conversations we're going to need to have to get these innovations into the marketplace. So I, I would say, um, don't underestimate your, your ability to, to impact that. Right. I was going to, I mean, I was going to say some of what Sarah said, but I'll just add on to that, that, you know, I mean, that's right. Talk to your, talk to your policymakers, talk to your politicians, talk to, talk to the government, talk to, I would say, talk to scientists. You know, if you're in the United States, what state you're in, go talk to your land grant scientists who are working on agriculture. Tell them what you, what you think they should be done. They'll listen to you. Um, they'll want to listen to you and also find other stakeholder groups that uh, align with the ideas you have and get involved in those groups. They're always looking for members and looking for people who, who, who bring a new perspective. Salim? Yeah, no, uh, I want to add more. I, I agree that uh, there are increasingly citizen science movement that also try to engage with the formal science organization. And I think this is also part of the kind of uh, thing that is needed uh, to bring also more dialogue between different knowledge systems, I would say, and, and that would um, really be uh, helpful to uh, open up uh, the scope of, the, of this discussion. And maybe and one last the, question, if we could do a, a round. Um, what's the one thing we need to do to better for better risk governance of gene-edited crops or better governance in the future? What is your vision for this going forward and then we'll stop with that. So let's see who's ready, who wants to start? Well, one of the things for me, speaking for the Global South, is how are we not just consumers, but producers of technologies that are benefiting what we see are the most urgent pressing needs. So part of it, is the dynamics is, is not being a passive player, being active at the innovation level, being active at the policy and regulatory level, so that can the engagement can really be an engagement that uh, is is a an equitable partnership, participatory engagement. Great. Um, I would go back to what I said earlier, which is I think we should look at the technology and different applications of the technology. So not talk of, about it in a uniform way, a homologous homologous way, but look at it as it's segmented based on the kinds of products that can apply. And look at you know is there a potential risk and if that if there's such is there a risk that we should be ma managing in some way through regulation, and I think uh, the issue I think we've made a mistake by saying is this a GMO or is this a conventional product we put a uh, a dichotomy out there and that's not a good way to look at this I think we should look at that the other thing is I know there are a bunch of questions people have asked about you know do consumers have a right to this information or that information and things like that I think consumers want the information they want to know whatever that is. They don't want people to tell them what information they should have. If they are interested in information, that's what should be available to them. And so I think that's something to keep in mind also. And Sarah or the food manufacturers would clearly say, consumers, 
want whatever information they want. Maybe it may not be science-based. It may not be what you think they should have. But if they want it, it's important to them. And that's what the market's going to address. Sarah? Yeah, Greg, just just following up on that, I think when I think about my the vision for for moving forward with all of this, it's how are we ensuring that we we're having the right kind of dialogues to build trust, but that also when we're learning from one another during those dialogues, that then we're we're fulfilling our obligations to one another. So if if we're listening to the consumers, as Greg as Greg uh, mentioned, and we're learning what they want, and we're able to provide that information, then how are the consumers acting in return? I think that's something that um, that we have a, a lot to learn about. But if we can all come together and realize that um, our, our values are aligned, and that this technology is a great tool in order to be able to achieve some of our common goals, then, then how are we moving forward together to ensure that the system is working? Great. And Salim, the last word. Yeah, so, yeah, thank you. And for me, I would be a bit provocative here. And, and I would say that by contrast to the idea of science-based decision, I think I would rather push for political-based science in the sense of uh, having more, uh, again, democracy in science. And uh, it's clear that the policy and political dimension is usually seen as a kind of dirty business, uh, something that uh, impacts robustness and impartiality that is needed for science. But the way I understand it, it's more for scientists to be more, uh, to pay more attention to the context, to pay more attention to the diversity of, of knowledge system, and to pay more attention to the consequence of, of, of uh, its work. So it's more that those three dimensions that are important uh, to consider. Uh, Wonderful. And to well, I want to thank all of you on the, the panel so much. You, of, you did a great job of, of answering the questions and and um, being engaged. So thank you. And thank all of you for attending and, and make sure to check out the expo space. And I want to thank Keystone again. And I hope that we can continue these very uh, productive and um, important dialogues about gene edited uh, plants and food products. So thank you very much. Julie. All right. Yeah, I think echoing the thanks and extending it as well to Jennifer, along with Elian, Sarah, Greg, and Salim. Um, really appreciate the conversation today. And um, we hope you'll stick around as now we'll be trans, uh, transitioning to our ideas marketplace in the sessions tab on the left-hand side of your screen. You can click on that button um, and choose a session. We have two today that we'll each be exploring in different ways, um, a continuation of the conversation on gene editing, agriculture, and governance of risks and benefits. Up to 20 people can join the discussion with video and audio. So we hope you'll click on that, share your screens, and and uh, participate yourselves in the conversation. Um, and thank you to our audience for participating all along today. Um, again, thanks to the Genetic Engineering and Society Center at North Carolina State University, um, Jennifer and her colleagues, Patty, Katie, and others for your leadership and in-kind partnership this week. And thanks to our sponsors, as well as all of our CRISPR-Con advisors listed at crispercon.org. Um, Thanks uh, as well to the audience, and I hope you'll tune in on Thursday as well for our next session. Um, it'll be 3 p.m. Eastern and focusing on intersections of conservation, climate justice, and gene editing. Um, today's session will be available on our CRISPR-Con YouTube channel within 24 hours, as are all of our past sessions. So please uh, feel free to go back and check out today's content and also content that you may have missed earlier this year or in past years. That concludes our live content for today. Um, hope to see most of you in the sessions section for our Ideas Marketplace. And also continue the dialogue on Twitter at hashtag CRISPRCon2020. Register for future events. We have one more week coming up at the end of this month uh, focused on priority and agenda setting. And you can also, again, visit our expo at any time between now and the close of programming on Thursday. Thanks again. Please carry on the conversation. Mm -hmm.